We've already had um, some very rich discussion of economic, political, uh, and, and uh, some security issues. Um, but now it's time to look at Central Asia, but also look at the role of th the three major powers that have interests in the region um, and how they're defining their interests, how they might define them going forward. We've, we've heard already about how central, different Central Asian countries look at the major players, uh, uh, the United States, Russia, and China, uh, but now we're going to sort of um, take it from uh, um, Beijing and Washington and Moscow. So I thought that we would go in the order. We'll have Ambassador John Ordway first, then Eugene Rumer, and then Sebastian Peru, since we understand that China is the real rising power uh, in Central Asia. Uh, so our first speaker will be Ambassador John Ordway. Uh, he's currently the U.S. representative in, uh, to the U.S. Russian Bilateral Compliance Commission under the New START Treaty. He is a career foreign service officer. Uh, he has spent much of his career in Eurasia, uh, including serving as a U.S. ambassador to Armenia and to Kazakhstan. Uh, and, um, of course, he was recalled from retirement, as many of our good diplomats who served in Central Asia were. Uh, and so he has gone back to Kazakhstan several times. So we're delighted to have you here. We look forward to your remarks. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks for the invitation and for bringing me all the way from sunny California. Um, I, there's a little bit of repetition in here from what you've uh, heard before, but as the Russians say, repetition is the mother of learning, so maybe I can contribute to the learning process. But it definitely is true that U.S. policy towards Central Asia has, has gone through two phases, and we are now embarked on a third one. So let me first start by briefly reviewing where we've gone before turning to the very real challenges of this emerging new third stage. Uh, a lot of people, I think, believe that the United States has a very short attention span. We pay a lot of attention to new problems and new challenges when they come up, but then do not devote the attention or resources over the longer term to ensure that our initial efforts remain successful. So keep that in mind as I talk a little bit about these first two stages. Uh, also, I, I have to admit that personally I'm somewhat biased since nearly 100 percent of my efforts over the past 20 years have been focused on the former USSR. So perhaps I've seen continuity of effort and engagement where others have seen a drop in focus and attention, although neither my focus nor my attention have dropped. Uh, but it is true that the press, the public, and Congress have been most engaged with the challenges of Central Asia in connection with two major transformative events. The first, the collapse of the USSR. 1991, and secondly, the terrorist attacks of 9-11, which marked the beginnings of the first two phases I'd like to address. So phase one really was precipitated by the collapse of the USSR, and um, I was deputy director of the Office of Soviet Union Affairs in December 1991 at the State Department and was personally caught up in the challenge of trying first to devise and then to implement, more or less on the fly, our policy toward and relations with the 11 non-Russian states that emerged from the USSR. Now, you may say there were 15 republics. Well, three of them were the Baltics, which were a completely different track and a different part of the State Department. And Russia, as always, was sui generis. It really was a different animal than the other 11. So there were two main concerns, two things that really came to the forefront as we came to work every day in those first few weeks. The first was, how do we ensure appropriate command, control, and in some cases disposition of Soviet nuclear forces and other WMD programs? And second, how do we nurture statehood, sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity for all these new nations? And again, as you come to work every day and you think about what can happen, well, there were some pretty horrible things that could have happened back there in early 1992 and that we wanted to prevent. First of all, we wanted to prevent descent into the abyss of chaos that involved countries with nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. And we also, perhaps both in the short and the longer term, wanted to avoid something that would recreate the USSR under a new guise that would present all the expense and difficult challenges, threats, sometimes existential, that we faced during the Cold War that at that point we hoped had ended. So, Turning Central Asia, what did this mean for us? First of all, the first job, job one, was to establish relationships. And Secretary of State James Baker made a couple of trips to the former Soviet Union in December 1991 that were aimed at extending recognition, opening diplomatic relations. And we were usually the first one to arrive. 
with this new card in our hand. The second focus uh, was something really that uh, was a primary American focus, not so much concern initially to other people, was nonproliferation. And the second U.S. Air Force plane to land in independent Kazakhstan was with Undersecretary Reggie Bartholomew in January 1992, focused on helping them realize that they needed to get control over exports of sensitive technologies, of which they had a lot. The reason I remember that trip was I was on it. But Kazakhstan in particular had the challenge of a full range of Soviet nuclear infrastructure, silos, missiles, warheads, highly enriched uranium stocks, nuclear testing facilities. There were also former chemical and bio facilities in Central Asia. So as, as the year went by uh, and the next few years emerged, the Nun Lugar program, which was very generously funded by Congress, attacked all those problems head on with money, programs, expertise, and relationships. Um, and in fact, right now, the um, National Security Archive at George Washington University has embarked on an oral history project looking back at the early days of Nun Lugar. They had a session in the United States, and they are planning within the next few months, hopefully, to have a session in Kazakhstan with some of the original participants, U.S., Russian, and Kazakh, uh, to try to capture the history of that really critical transformative period that it's hard to imagine how history might have gone otherwise, but it could have gone a lot worse than it did. Uh, another institution that played a, not perhaps such a headline role, but I think a very important one, and one which has a lot of potential today, is the International Science and Technology Center, which was originally established in Moscow. Uh, the Russians have now withdrawn. It's moving its headquarters to Kazakhstan. Its original goal was to keep weapon scientists and their knowledge and expertise at home and not going to the highest bidder. But it also, I think, has some important potential applications today as well. Another thing that we did in those early days was try to work on building military and other security institutions in countries that had really never had them. They particularly never had the military ones, and the security institutions had always done just basically what Moscow had told them to do. So in the military side, we used uh, modest amounts of uh, military assistance, grant assistance, to, to purchase things, and even more importantly, uh, military education programs, IMET, uh, that really did keep us in the game with these military establishments that naturally gravitated to the long established patterns of cooperation and coordination with Moscow that, that they had had and which continue to play an important role today. But in the process we discovered I think an important lesson when efforts to build interest Central Asian military cooperation through Central Asia Battalion floundered and were then abandoned as rivalries and different interests of the five countries proved to be way too big to overcome. This was an initial lesson about the conflicts among the five Central Asian states that we are constantly relearning, and I think we've heard about it some already today. Another vector that, uh, that caused our interest to focus immediately was what to do with the OSCE. Uh, and, and this, in some ways, is, is a much more important issue than perhaps you might think. Uh, initially, our, uh, our European partners were somewhat reluctant to, in their view, extend OSCE, the E in there stands for Europe, into Central Asia, which is Asia. Uh, but we really did insist that the, that, that the OSCE framework, which extended to all the USSR, needed to extend to all of the successor states, and we were ultimately successful, and I think our European friends and allies are now quite happy with that arrangement. Uh, this. And, and, and our goal was, particularly with Central Asia, to help keep their looking north and west for their future and their inspiration, rather than south and east. And this emphasis also led naturally to outreach efforts then by NATO, which was also spearheaded by the U.S. initially to establish the North, north Atlantic Cooperation Council, the NACSI, and then eventually a few years later the Partnership for Peace, which continues to be an important institution maintaining and improving capability and relationships between NATO and the countries of Central Asia. It's really hard to think back 23 years ago uh, to what it, what it was like, economic chaos, political vacuum, collapse of social and medical systems, and tremendous uncertainty about both the present and the future. And ethnic relationships also began framed pretty early on. And the United States had a sort of a full-scale attack. I think you heard a little bit about it from, from Dick Hoagland, but, and it's a little bit outside the theme of the session, but I should mention we did work intensively on economic development, social reform, education, democracy, and human rights. Uh, 
our exchange programs ranging from Bradley, later the Flex High School exchanges to the postgraduate Muskie program, unfortunately now dead, were fabulously successful. So let me turn to, to phase two. The, the initial period lasted roughly a decade. I, it was roughly a decade of, I think, falling public interest and in somewhat diminishing public resources being applied to the problem. But still, from the State Department point of view and, 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 and AID, there was still a lot of emphasis on that. But 9-11 did mark a serious major turning point. Uh, with Central Asia directly bordering Afghanistan, the region assumed critical importance in two regards. First, there were important transit and logistic potential that needed to be acquired to support our military activity in Afghanistan. And secondly, uh, over the previous decade, there was sort of a small gradual appearance of indigenous groups in Central Asia that shared the radical agenda of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And patterns of cooperation were beginning to emerge, and some of these groups did join in combat in Afghanistan and elsewhere. So we quickly began negotiations for access, overflight, basing rights throughout the region, fairly successfully and fairly quickly, particularly in Kyrgyzstan with the establishment of a U.S. Air Force transit hub at Manas Air Base outside of Bishkek, and air operations at Karshi Khanabad Air Base in Uzbekistan. Both of them now closed. Um, we also worked more quietly to develop capacity to identify and counter violent extremist groups inside Central Asia, to cut off their relationships with groups in Afghanistan and Pakistan, to eliminate their sources of funding, to impede their travel, and to undercut any domestic base of support. So again, over the course of basically a little more than a decade, uh, public attention again waned. And as we uh, face the, the withdrawal of all U.S. forces from Afghanistan, uh, at least active combat forces, um, this is one of the hallmarks of the transition to this new emerging third stage. First of all, let me say that 20 years after the emergence of these new nation states, they are no longer new. They are definitely nation states, however. And we see the region as the fulcrum of multiple strategic interests, a region that can provide goods and energy to the booming economies of South and East Asia and serve as a bridge between Eurasia and Europe, a region that is critical to the transition in Afghanistan by creating the connectivity that can advance regional prosperity and security and a region where the United States has shared objectives with the Central Asian states to counter transnational crime, narco-trafficking, terrorism, and extremism. Not since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 and its immediate after aftermath has Central Asia faced so much uncertainty about its future security. So let me touch upon events happening in Central Asia's immediate neighborhood that have directly shaped its security environment, not to mention broader global norms. These include the transition in Afghanistan, reverberations of Russia's actions in Ukraine, and the rise of extremist groups like ISIL. So with regard to Afghanistan, every Central Asian state has expressed concern for some time about American staying power there. If it were up to them, we'd still be there in full force. And except for Kazakhstan, every one of them has worried publicly that the NATO departure from Afghanistan will lead to more instability in the region. They remain anxious about potential civil war spilling into their territories, an influx of terrorists from Afghanistan, or worse, the outright collapse of the new Afghan government. Given their internal political and economic weaknesses, they feel vulnerable to subversion by trained fighters who, I hesitate to say this, but certainly are no strangers to Central Asia. Uh, and in addition, there are no collective security mechanisms in place to effectively address such challenges. Just one technical footnote, the CSTO, which we talked about some today, only has the responsibility of responding to external challenges. If they're internal challenges, the CSTO has no legal responsibility to address them. It doesn't mean that Russia wouldn't use it in that circumstance, but certainly doesn't, doesn't guarantee anything. Um, for Afghanistan, this is really a moment of transition, and the, both the challenges, the potential problems, and the possibilities are enormous. We're convinced that U.S. support for and engagement with the countries of Central Asia serve our long-term national security interests in Afghanistan and in the region. And we are committed to ensuring that Afghanistan can never again be used as a safe haven from which terrorists can threaten the international community, and that is an end state our friends in Central Asia fervently desire. 
Our Central Asia partners share our view that the most effective way to advance this objective is to support Afghanistan's political unity and its security. But Afghanistan is not the only security challenge facing Central Asia. The United States will continue to work closely with our partners in Central Asia to enhance border security and to counter violent extremism. We're also working to enhance uh, professional capabilities of Central Asia's security forces so they can better secure their borders and contribute to international peacekeeping operations. We're helping Kazakhstan develop its peacekeeping battalion and are working with Kyrgyzstan to facilitate its deployment of a field hospital unit in support of UN peacekeeping efforts. We're also working to enhance Central Asian states' ability to address transnational threats like narcotics trafficking. And uh, in Turkmenistan, just for one example, the U.S. is working with counter-narcotics units and border patrol officers to improve their interdiction and border patrol skills, as well as countering transnational crimes such as human trafficking and money laundering. Let me turn to Russia for a minute. And we've heard a lot about Russia today, I think quite rightfully. And it's clear that Russia has been a major fact factor in the destiny of Central Asia since at least the 17th century and is probably the single most important external influence in the region. The modern history of the region revolves around an expansionist Russia confronting the nomads and central settled populations of Central Asia in conflict from, with outside forces from China, Iran, and during the 19th century Britain. For most of the 20th century, Russia was the winner and unquestioned dominant power in Central Asia, a period that still has profound consequences today. For the Central Asian states, from their perspective, independence, which they all value very highly, is almost by definition independence from Russia. And while there is no doubt that they became de jure independent in 1991, their actual independence and sovereignty has evolved over the past 20 years. A shared historical past, common educational and political systems, the continued importance of the Russian language, especially in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, the dominance of Russian Federation television, a common Russian language internet space, transportation links, roads, railroads, and pipelines, and simple geography combined to provide Russia with a preeminent position in the region. Now, Russian actions in Ukraine have undermined the confidence of each of the five governments, although the impact has not been uniform and neither has been the reaction. The economic contagion effects of Russia's weakening economy and currency have also had a major impact, as we just heard in the last panel. The countries of Central Asia have legitimate concerns about the direction their economies are headed. They have understandable concerns about how U.S. sanctions on certain Russian entities might ha hamper investment and growth in their countries. So let me focus for a moment on Kazakhstan, which obviously I know best of the five. Given their geographic, demographic, and economic situation, they have decided that the best defense is a strategy of engagement. And here, let me take a little brief detour and talk about the two prevailing schools of bear management in the world. First school, which you might call school A, is you're up against the cliff. The bear is coming down toward you. The first thing you do is you look around and you pick up some rocks and you throw them at your friends. The next thing you do is you throw rocks at the bear. This is not likely to be a successful strategy. School B of bear management is you're in the exact same situation. Your back is up against the cliff. You rush out and you grab the bear and you hug it as tightly as you can for two purposes. One, to convince the bear you really love it. And two, to keep the bear's claws from killing you. And then you look around for all the friends you can find to help you hug the bear even tighter. Now, I won't identify the primary exponent of theory A. But theory B is definitely the way Kazakhstan approaches this. And we are in the friend category, and they're looking for help to keep that bear firmly hugged. Um, and this is why, I think, they want to really not just as they go closer in to this relationship with Russia, and you've heard somewhat about the, the emerging Eurasian Economic Union, mm -hmm. the customs union they've been in for a while, but they also see even greater value in maintaining and improving their relationship with all of the other major powers, the US, the EU, and China, as a counterbalance to this closer engagement with Russia. But getting this balance right and maintaining good relations with all sides in our current hostile environment is really tough. 
But I think it's in our interest, the American interest, to maintain and where possible enhance our relationship if they are to have any chance at all of maintaining their independent sovereignty and territorial integrity, which after all was one of our two initial bedrock goals that we were seeking in the region. So this means in particular moving forward with WTO accession for Kazakhstan, facilitating trade and investment, continuing robust exchange programs, having high level visits in both directions, having a smart and targeted military relationship that focuses on military reform and engagement, and energy security, reliable transportation routes, continuing nonproliferation work, and supporting educational reforms. We have some tried and true, tr tried and true tools we can use. Uh, exchange programs have been in high demand. The ISCC that I mentioned is also uh, deserves our continued engagement and support. Um, finally, let me just quickly mention the uh, terrorist, uh, uh, current terrorist situation. Uh, there, 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 while the initial post 9 11 uh, efforts were perhaps successful, um, the IMU was at least temporarily disrupted by the uh, US led coalition actions in Afghanistan. Nonetheless, over time, it appears some terrorist cells have reformed and expanded in Central Asia, and that some have been even more closely allied with international terrorist groups particularly ISIL. And Islamic terrorist threats to the Central Asian governments may well increase as economic distress fails to dissipate or even widens. Heavy unemployment, poverty rates, all these make a vulnerable place perhaps even more vulnerable. So we have very strong concerns about ISIL's efforts to recruit foreign fighters, including from Central Asia. It's an issue of concern for each one of the Central Asian states and an area in which we've had some really good fruitful conversations as we look for ways to counter ISIL's efforts. And indeed, just a few weeks ago, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan had high-level delegations to a White House-hosted CVE summit here. And Kazakhstan is going to host a regional countering violent extremism conference for Central and South Asian countries this summer. So my conclusion is hopefully neither too optimistic nor too pessimistic, but that Central Asia is a very dynamic region in every sense and that while their security challenges pose some, pose some really serious threats to the region and its citizens, it's also creating a unique geopolitical opportunity. Expanding our cooperation with our Central Asian partners can help them respond to, secure, secure, respond to shared security challenges while solidifying our diplomatic ties and helping build strong and broad partnerships. Cooperation in the area of national defense can support our efforts to cooperate in other areas as well. And I think I'll stop with that. Is that probably Thank, time? Thank you very much. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Eugene Rumer. He is uh, the senior, a senior associate and director of the Russia Eurasia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Prior to that, he served as the national intelligence officer for Russia and Eurasia uh, at the National Intelligence Council. He's also worked in the State Department and in the White House. Uh, he has his PhD from MIT and his master's degree from Ceres. So, please. Thank you, Angela, and thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, speak here today. Um, one of the disadvantages of speaking on the concluding panel is that a lot has been said and uh, uh, we're following in the footsteps of some really rich, informative and thoughtful presentations. So I could almost go by the numbers and say that uh, I agree with point seven, twelve, and 14 of Marlene Laruelle's presentation and, um, uh, and Scott Radness's points one, seven, and 12. Um, but um, I, I, I won't do that, um, uh, and really um, 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 the task here on our panel is a little bit different um, than uh, during those uh, extremely informative and thoughtful panels. Um, um, looking at the security situation in Central Asia, and Angela's tasking to me was really to cover it sort of as it's seen from the Russian angle. Um, um, I. Um, um, also came up with um, um, sort of three phases um, um, that cover um, uh, the last 25 years or so um, uh, in um, the evolution of Central Asia and the security environment there. Um, and it roughly corresponds, I think, to the evolution of our own thinking about security. And here the milestones have really been external to Central Asia. Uh, 
most of them in any case. The first milestone was the breakup of the Soviet Union and the emergence of Central Asia as such, and every article I think written throughout the 1990s about the security environment in Europe and Eurasia talked about the breakup of the Soviet Union marked a new phase in the evolution of the international security environment. Right, so that took us until 2001, and then after 9/11, everything uh, we could almost do a, a, a global replace on anything we wrote and say post 9/11. We're now at a different phase. Both um, the post Cold War and, to a large extent, post 9/11 uh, phases are over, and we're now in the post Crimea phase, and I think that is at the moment at least, the defining characteristic of the security environment uh, in Central Asia. Um, there are several uh, developments underway, some of which uh, have already been referred to by Ambassador Ordway. Of course, the changing nature of U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, which was, which was the hallmark of the um, um, of previous decade and a half's uh, uh, environment in, in security environment in Central Asia. And then, of course, the post-Crimea, post-Russian annexation of Crimea. Uh, in general, any time there is a crisis in relations between Russia the United, and the United States, um, uh, countries of the former Soviet Union and in Central Asia, is, Central Asia is no ex ex exception here, have found themselves themselves in a difficult environment because when major sort of tectonic plates collide, when major players on the geopolitical landscape of Central Asia collide, the space for maneuver for smaller states decreases. And I think that has been the situation since the East-West relationship, really. How many of us remember that from the Cold War days? I think this term is coming back into existence. But uh, the space uh, has significantly decreased for Central Asia in the newly um, controver adversarial relationship between Washington and Moscow. And that's not a good thing because Historically, over the past 25 years or so, these countries have uh, become quite proficient in carving out a space for their own independent multi-vectoral multi foreign policies. Um, uh, when they try to exploit those uh, openings in relations between East and West, between Russia and the United States, um, too much um, when they uh, cross certain bounds, um, things did not turn out very well. Ukraine is one example. You know, Kovic tried to uh, 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 carve a path between Russia and the United States and Europe uh, uh, and ended up uh, living in Russia, uh, which is not the path that uh, Central Asian leaders uh, want to follow. Uh, and not everybody is as lucky as Lukashenko has been for the past uh, uh, several years. Uh, also, I should say that as somebody else pointed out, geography really makes a big difference here, and being close to Europe um, is, is important, as we see in, in Central Asia's case, um, uh, uh, it does not have the same advantage. Uh, and, and, and this new phase in Central Asian security uh, evolution comes at a difficult time, because these are countries that have have still significant vulnerabilities, long-term vulnerabilities. A lot of this was already covered during the uh, previous sessions, but there are questions about the sustainability of uh, domestic uh, political arrangements. There are questions about the inevitable political transitions in two of the biggest and most important countries. And here I should say that the newly assertive Russia, or not so newly assertive Russia, but much more assertive Russian than it had been before on the landscape of Eurasia is a very difficult and complicating factor for these countries. Um, um, it is as much of a factor for countries that don't face immediate prospects of transition, but all five of these countries, I mean, I've been here, the, the two, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, all countries, all of these are vulnerable. Uh, and the reasons for these vulnerabilities have already been discussed by others. Uh, uh, and I'll just mention briefly the fact that uh, Russia remains the largest employer of Central Asian labor outside of Central Asia. Their remittances are hugely important. Uh, and for countries like Kazakhstan, having uh, an alternative to increasingly growing China as a partner and access to markets in the West is, uh, is, is a hugely important strategic factor. 
So um, um, they, they find themselves uh, in, um, in a new and uh, difficult predicament. Um, perversely, perhaps, one of the restraining factors on Russian assertiveness on the newly this changed Central Asian landscape is the fact that China is the, uh, the, the, the major economic player, increasingly the political player um, on the Central Asian uh, scene. And here, perhaps I would disagree with some of the comments previously about Central Asian discomfort with uh, China's growing role in a region. For sure, there's a great deal of discomfort. But at the same time, I'm just struck by how much the relationship bet between Russia and, and, and between China and Central Asia has expanded. Uh, looking just at the trade figures uh, from 2000 to 2013, um, trade uh, between Central Asia, overall trade exports and imports between China and Central Asia went from just under $2 billion to over $50 billion. And when you talk to Central Asian colleagues, as I have had a chance on occasion, the level of comfort and understanding of what's happening in China has improved dramatically. And um, again, visiting China, um, as I had a chance recently, um, and speaking at universities, there are students from Central Asia attending universities in China. It's a totally different picture than what we saw in the 1990s when China was still largely terra incognita. So uh, if you ask the question of, um, 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 you know, a question that is guided by events of the past year and is probably on the minds of uh, many of us, even if we don't voice it necessarily, is Russia going to assert itself on the Central Asian landscape the same way uh, as it has asserted itself uh, with Ukraine? Uh, my answer is definitely no. I think in these circumstances, um, uh, China plays an increasingly, an, important, an increasingly important factor and will continue to do so with the promised $40 billion investment fund and the attended political strengths that will expand in the region. Uh, looking at it from the Russian perspective, the relationship with China is probably the single most important relationship for Russia on its foreign policy landscape, and I very much doubt that China would risk, sorry, Russia would risk upsetting that relationship. Um, uh, and find itself in a near total international isolation uh, after it broke off or largely disrupted its relationship with Europe and the United States. Besides, um, if uh, Russian security or when Russian security analysts look at the strategic landscape in Central Asia, um, the challenges there are not the same as they um, were in Ukraine before the beginning of the uh, conflict in Ukraine. Uh, NATO is not rushing into Central Asia. The United States was effectively expelled from Central Asia militarily uh, after the closure of the transit uh, facility at Manas. Uh, and there is no prospect of Central, of Central Asia once again hosting American troops uh, on its territory. Uh, so from that standpoint, uh, from Russian most tangible, concrete understanding of its security, uh, there is little chance uh, uh, of a major disruptive uh, force emerging uh, on the territory of Central Asia uh, for years and years to come. Uh, as to uh, looking at other security challenges to Central Asia, such as the ones emerging possibly from a future, uh, or potential, I should say, instability in Afghanistan, um, there Russia is likely to play uh, probably the role of a, uh, of a partner more than the United States is likely to play. Some of it comes from the fact that U.S. security assistance tends to come with strings attached. And the United States, despite all our best efforts of the past 25 years, has proven to be somewhat of a fickle partner. Uh, uh, and even when we promise or you know try to uh, improve our security relations with local countries, with, with local governments. Um, the best efforts of our executive branch run into significant congressional opposition, uh, and that, in the minds of our Central Asian uh, partners, I think, is a major obstacle to uh, better relations uh, in the security sphere. Of course, they will accept what uh, efforts, uh, what, what, what help we can offer them, but uh, 
uh, this is not to say that the United States could possibly ever, in the foreseeable future, I should say, replace the role that Russia can play in the security environment in Central Asia. Uh, so, uh, for the foreseeable future, I see this largely uh, as a region where um, uh, the governments will continue to uh, pursue their very delicate balancing act with the United States somewhat of a distant partner whose ex assistance will be accepted, um, uh, but very quietly, uh, without uh, raising any concerns uh, in Russia or in China. Um, uh, and with Russia and China increasingly becoming the dominant external geopolitical uh, managers of the environment uh, in the region. I should say that, and this is important, it's somewhat out of context, but one very tangible, perhaps, consequence of uh, the developments in Ukraine uh, is that this is something that Matt Sagers, you did not address, I believe, really as explicitly as perhaps it was worth addressing, and this is really not a f function of the economics or the state of the market, it's rather a state of uh, regional politics, but the Trans-Caspian pipeline is dead. Uh, to the extent that it wasn't dead before, after the uh, 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 conflict in Ukraine, I see absolutely no chance of uh, the Trans-Caspian Pipeline being built unless Russia somehow magically changes its mind and uh, relaxes its opposition to it. So that really sort of consolidates uh, the situation that others have referred to with the major trading routes being controlled by Russia uh, and increasingly by China. Um, and uh, to, to a large extent, uh, that is, uh, uh, I don't want to say the geography is destiny, but uh, it will play a huge role um, uh, in, in, in the future of Central Asia. Um, the EU, um, I don't see the European Union really as a player. Uh, in my view, it has never been a player in Central Asian security affairs, uh, despite the presence of occasional ambassadors uh, visiting, uh, doing swings through the, uh, through the region. But the European Union now has uh, so much more in its plate, inter plate internally, domestically, um, that uh, Central Asia is really a, a bridge too far. Um, so um, a mixture of good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is that uh, the space for maneuver for the Central Asian countries uh, is uh, significantly reduced in the aftermath of the crisis of Ukraine, in Ukraine. Um, but um, 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 they all have uh, managed uh, difficult relations with Russia for a long, long time. They know how to handle Russia. Um, and uh, they're open to quiet engagement with the United States, uh, which they see as a distant, if you wish, perhaps a balancing uh, actor. And Russia has its hands full with um, um, uh, uh, problems, uh, challenges on its western front, uh, not to get involved in Central Asia more aggressively. I'll stop at that and uh, turn it over to Sebastian. Thank you very much. Listening to Eugene, it makes me think that if only the uh, China had had greater economic interests in Ukraine, you know, <laughs> Ukraine might have turned out differently. But anyway, um, our third speaker is Dr. Sebastian Perus. He's a research professor in the Central Asia program in the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University. He's a senior fellow at the East-West Institute, and he has a wide uh, range of expertise, uh, including political systems in Central Asia, economic and social issues, Islam and religious minorities, and Central Asia's geopolitical positioning toward China, India, and South Asia. And I think he's going to focus on the Chinese interest here. Thank you very much, Angela. First, I would like to thank you for having invited me today to, to present. Uh, so yes, what I would like to do today is to try to present very briefly what is Central Asia for, for China. Uh, China's strategy vis-a-vis -vis Central Asia has, uh, I would say, very pragmatic objectives, which are based on a long tradition of uh, adopting a wait-and-see approach. Uh, and first, Beijing regards uh, Central Asia as a buffer zone 
and I would say that despite many challenges and a negative overall image in Central Asia, especially in the 1990s, uh, it has really succeeded in improving its reputation in Central Asia with its soft uh, power uh, diplomacy. An important point, I think, uh, in the Chinese perception of its uh, environment is that Central Asia is not only a part of the post-Soviet world, but also a part of West Asia. What does that mean? Uh, since the 19th century, China saw its development concentrated on its maritime facade, but today, uh, Chinese elites uh, ruling elites know that domestic unity and stability, not to mention actually uh, great power uh, status, will pass through a rebalancing in favor of uh, the continent. So Beijing is therefore increasingly looking toward building a privileged partnership with the Muslim world, and we have seen that, for example, despite there are very distant relations throughout the 20th century. China has been rapidly establishing itself in Afghanistan over the last few years. So we already talked about that, I won't talk a lot, but obviously China's first aim uh, in Central Asia was and is uh, to develop its economic influence. Uh, China has come to position itself on the Chinese, uh, Central Asia, sorry, has come to position itself on the Chinese radar as partial solution to a main concern that is uh, securing continental energy supplies that are not subject to uh, global geopolitical uh, complications. Uh, in Chinese energy strategies, uh, Kazakhstan has emerged as an exporter, as we already said, of oil and uranium, and Turkmenistan as an exporter of gas, while Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan have the potential uh, still unrealized to export hydroelectricity. And second important point is that Beijing's interest in Central Asia is also driven by the transformation of Xinjiang and Central Asia into areas of uh, transit trade for the conquest of new uh, markets. But uh, there's two uh, Elements, I think, must not be uh, overestimated. Why? Because today, Central Asia represents uh, less than 2% of for, uh, foreign trade of, of China and will not uh, replace, obviously, the Middle East in terms of hydrocarbon supplies. But, obviously, uh, China's engagement in landlocked Central Asia has long-term implications. Chinese investment in infrastructures enables the Central Asian states to escape from the increased isolation from which they have suffered after uh, the fall of the, uh, Soviet, uh, of the, of the Soviet Union. Uh, in the development and opening of Central Asia, Chinese, uh, China seems destined actually to play uh, the same role in the South in the uh, 21st century that Russia played in the North in the 19th and 20th century. So Central Asian societies benefit from consumer products that are appropriate to their low standard of living, but which are also capable of satisfying the growing uh, technology uh, consumption needs of the middle classes, and in particular in Kazakhstan. Uh, the massive influx of Chinese products also gives uh, people of Central Asia the opportunity to reassume their traditional role uh, as a transit culture exporting goods. And we heard a lot this last month of uh, the Silk Road uh, economic belt with something like more than 16 billion of, uh, uh, fund, uh, dollars of funds to finance construction of uh, infra infrastructures, railways, roads and pipelines linking China to, uh, to Europe, which is definitely a part of, uh, I mean, this program is definitely a part of Chinese strategy to develop its economic relations and to have a stronger, a growing economic role in Central Asia. And if this project is realized, uh, this means that over the coming decades, China's trade uh, domination over Central Asia will very, very likely be confirmed. Uh, Central Asian consumers will then could follow uh, Chinese trends in everyday consumption goods, as well as in high uh, tech products, but also part partially in foodstuffs. And but contrary to uh, the apparent conclusion of a quick view of the situation, Chinese control over Kazakh oil is not uh, completely established, and that over Turkmen gas and Kazakh uranium actually might be more determining. But the real 
locus of Chinese power resides. Uh, it's the massive investment in Central Asia infrastructures, communications, and potentially new technologies. And it's still to be developed control of industrial structures and electricity production. Uh, it's too early, I guess, to assess the consequences of the Russian crisis on Chinese presence, on Chinese economic presence in Central Asia. But very probably, the economic crisis uh, this provokes in, uh, in Central Asia and a decrease of trade between Western countries and the EU member uh, might give even more opportunities for China to develop uh, its economic presence in the region. So now, does uh, uh, China's economic presence in Central Asia uh, give it a political influence? And does China aim, actually, to have a political influence in uh, the region? And if yes, to what extent? Uh, Central Asia is fundamental in terms of domestic stability uh, because of the Uyghur issue, and Central Asia's ethnic contiguity, contiguity with the Uyghur world is really perceived by Beijing since independence more as a danger than as an opportunity. Uh, but China is uh, aware of its uh, growing economic, uh, uh, that sorry, its uh, growing economic presence uh, elicits negative reactions sometimes, and that a political influence would be viewed even more uh, negatively. So, fearing actually some uh, negative reactions from uh, Central Asian uh, countries. It has used several means to impose some of its views, uh, of its views sorry, not, necessar not necessarily uh, in bilateral negotiations, but through international or uh, regional structures like the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, the SCO has established a collective discourse on the common threats they face based on the Chinese narrative of the three areas of fundamentalism, extremism, and secessionism. Uh, its greatest successes are probably the extradition treaty between member states, but beyond uh, the rhetoric cooperation of uh, the rhetoric of cooperation and the declarations of good intentions, it has experienced uh, many difficulties. Uh, and even if its realm of uh, predilections that is security, the RCO is relatively inactive in practice and unable to compete so far with Russian influence. As it was not designed to be a supranational organization, implying the reduced sovereignty of its members, it does not have a defined uh, military structure like the CSTO, for example. Nor is it a military defense alliance like NATO or seek to create multilateral uh, military or police units. And uh, despite the establishment in 2004 of an anti-terrorist center in Tashkent, uh, the uh, regional anti-terrorist structure, RATS, which was designed to develop common approaches to combat uh, terrorist movements, any uh, multilateral security uh, dynamic remains very weak in the framework of the SCO. So, if the, SC, uh, if the SCO is viewed as a mechanism to reinforce confidence between China and Central Asia, so yes, it has been, I think, an historical uh, success. But it, uh, if it is viewed as an organization that attempts to influence Central Asia political and security realities, for the time being at least, it's a, it appears to be a kind of paper tiger with the sole exception of the management, again, of the Uyghur issue. Um, so the SCO uh, seems therefore primarily to be a reflection of uh, Chinese willingness to support a so-called healthy Central Asian order free of any of the so-called three evils and devoid of pro-Western forces that might act to, to destabilize the region or viewed as such. Uh, and beyond the SCO, for the time being, Chinese bilateral uh, security military presence in Central Asia is also very limited, unable to rival Russia's major role. Uh, its aid, I mean, Chinese aid is restricted to uh, electronic uh, material, uh, automobiles, and includes almost no military cells, properly speaking. And finally, training aid is attempting to develop, but 
even this aid is, uh, remains uh, modest. So uh, actually, Western observers uh, often overestimate Chinese political influence over the Central Asian regimes. Even if the RCO partially limits the room in which the Central Asian states have to maneuver, uh, in particular uh, relative to the West, it provides the established regimes with an ideological framework by, by which to shore up their legitimacy on both the domestic and international fronts. The China Central Asia political rapprochement has had an impact on Central Asian societies. Beijing is, for instance, appreciated by governments by, uh, for providing technologies that restrict access to uh, uh, the internet and software that can block uh, dissident sites. But this is more an axis of convenience for the Central Asian regimes than a strategy that Beijing imposes by force. And also the SCO undeniably attempts to counter Western influence in the region. No Central Asian country wishes to pursue an aggressive policy against, uh, 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 aimed, sorry, directly against US interests or Western interests. The Central Asian states consider Western presence in the, Central, uh, in the region to be a guarantee of balance and agree that uh, the exclusive dual grip of Russia and uh, China is dangerous all the more uh, with the Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, China has uh, skillfully managed uh, asymmetric relationships and consolidated its security governance uh, mechanisms, but uh, the Chinese authorities are aware of their limits in managing their own national peripheries and have therefore, I think so far, little interest in getting too involved in the region that they see uh, as unstable. Uh, they have no interest in highlighting too uh, visibly their pressures on Central Asia and prefer to let the, the idea reign of a partnership in which uh, each actor is a winner, whether true or not. Uh, but Beijing therefore uh, supports the Russian uh, strategic presence and has so far played uh, how to say, uh, second fiddle to Moscow on security issues while seeking to dominate uh, in, the in the economic sphere. And above all else, uh, Beijing is seeking stability on its borders in order to uh, calmly manage domestic issues and remains reluctant to become more involved in Central Asia's uh, security. Uh, there are, of course, uh, doubts about uh, the future uh, solidarity, uh, soli uh, future sorry, solidity of the Rus Russian Chinese military partnership. The, uh, uh, the Russian Chinese partnership functions in Central Asia because uh, Beijing wishes to preserve Russian domination uh, in the region. Uh, so, but China really prefers to let Russia pay. Uh, the heavy cost of uh, military security and of guaranteeing the survival of an uh, unstable regime. However, uh, if China were one day to decide to take up the primary, the primary role in the political, military and cultural domains, it would likely uh, encounter uh, fierce opposition probably from uh, Moscow. But, and uh, this will be my last question, uh, do, China's goal, do China's goals really extend beyond the economic domain and the preservation of uh, stability in Central Asia? Uh, the Chinese authorities have no interest in visibly ratcheting sorry, ratcheting up their presence on the states in, of Central Asia. In the case of destabilization of one of the Central Asian states of uh, the Taliban's returning to power in Afghanistan, of an overthrow of the government in Pakistan, or of riots in Xinjiang, Beijing so far has all the necessary, necessary tools at its disposal to rally the Central Asian regime to its side and does not seem to want more. Uh, however, this does not mean that, broadly speaking, uh, China has no long-term objective in the region. Beijing is indeed in the process of rapidly setting itself up in Afghanistan. Uh, 
uh, to ensure its influence in the country, it has placed its bets on establishing close political relations with Kabul, assisting with the recon reconstruction effort, and on developing trade and economic relations. Uh, the chief aim behind the Chinese strategy of a large-scale settlement in Central Asia is therefore in the short term to secure the failing states of the region, namely Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. In the longer term, the goal is to open the region up to Iran and Turkey. And Beijing, in fact, sees this region as a primer uh, to develop a regional dynamic that could be extended to the West and which would open up the doors of the Middle East and the markets of the, Pers of the Persian girls. So Chinese revalorization of continental routes, again, as I said at the beginning, must be understood as a part of long-term uh, historical evolution. And I guess I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the three very rich presentations. I was very struck that in a panel on Central Asian security, Sebastian was the only person who mentioned the SCO. Uh, you then said it was a paper tiger um, and that it wasn't uh, a net provider right. of security. The right, what? The right, but yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the, the question is um, for our other two panelists, for, for John and you, Eugene, would you agree that the SCO is largely kind of not relevant uh, in a discussion of security in Central Asia? And would all three of you, um, because the conventional wisdom in the beginning was this is a means of managing rivalry between Russia and China in Central Asia, but I'm not sure that um, that's what I, I heard from you, Sebastian. Anyway, um, let me start with John. Yeah, I, I, I thought almost from the beginning that the SCO is, is an opportunity for the five Central Asian states to get Russia and China in the room at the same time at the highest level and that they can avoid getting whipsawed between the two of them. And, it, and, it is, and from that point of view, I think it's been a big success for the Central Asians. I'm not so sure it's been as big a success for the Russians or for the Chinese. And I would certainly agree it plays almost no security role whatsoever. It really is a talk shop. It's a very useful talk shop. But beyond that, even the so-called SCO military exercises are not particularly impressive in the way they are carried out. And, and clearly, you know, just most of the Central Asians continue to look at, at Russia as one of their primary military partners, whether it's in air defense or supplying weaponry, and they continue to look at NATO and the West for organizational advice, how you transition to a, to a lighter, more effective military. So they're trying to look for where they can get the best, and that road never leads to Beijing. Thanks. Jane? I agree. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, and well, so Sebastian, maybe, I'll yeah. give you one more word on this. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I obviously, I mean, the SCO is not doing a lot in terms of security. Uh, does that mean that the SCO hasn't done anything? No. I mean, at the, uh, when the SCO was created and before that, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, it was a way to negotiate the borders. It was a way for each country of Central Asia to know more China and not to feel less dominated because they were negotiating all together. Uh, so it was really a way, again, to, to get to know each other. But now, I mean, when we see where we are now with the, with the SCO, there are so many disagreements between members, between on, one, on the one hand China, which is really willing to make of the CSEO a kind of big uh, trade, uh, free trade zone, which the other countries, uh, I mean so Russia first and Central Asia, to are really afraid of. And on the other side, uh, on the other hand, Russia and Central Asia viewing really the SEO more as a security uh, organization, which again doesn't really work, considering uh, such uh, difficult relations in terms of uh, uh, and no cooperation in terms of uh, uh, military exchanges. Thank you. Okay, we have time for some questions. David Abramson. Yes, uh, David Abramson, State Department. I have a question for Jean. Um, you mentioned that China serves as a, a sort of um, a factor in in, um, in 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 your argument that Russia would not uh, do in Central Asia something that like what it's done in in Ukraine, um, and so I agree with that. But I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit or disaggregate Central Asia as a region, um, throwing into the mix 
uh, succession, say if there are succession struggles in Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan, um, could you see Russia possibly going too far, possibly a la uh, what the, uh, their pressure that they put on uh, Kyrgyzstan prior to Bakiev's overthrow in 2010? Um, you know, in fairness, this is such a non-transparent set of relationships for us that we're purely, you know, guessing here. I can imagine that Russia, that Beijing and Moscow would consult. Um, it's, it's not a particularly trusting relationship, especially where the two countries have competing interests. Um, and the Russians could overplay their hand, but, um, and, and I do think that um, they'll be trying to intervene uh, in any succession scenario, uh, and they have more opportunities to do so um, in, in the region than, than we do, and possibly than the Chinese. Um, I, again, this is purely guesswork on my part. I would think that um, there are enough equities on the part of Central Asian elites. Again, I'm not disaggregating this, but speaking, you know, again, these are huge categories. There, isn't, there are enough equities that they have in their relationship with China. Uh, and, um, you know, Russia is not totally dominant on, on the scene, that they'll be careful to protect their relationship with China uh, in, in any conversation with Russia about the future succession scenarios. So, um, I think it's the best we can do under the circumstances. I also think that, again, I'm not a Chinese expert, but my sense is that the Chinese are not likely to sort of directly challenge Russia uh, on, on, on something like that. It's likely to be sort of a, a strategy of indirect approach uh, to manifest itself over a period of time. Um, so. I think it's the best I can do under the circumstances. I mean, nobody is guaranteed from making mistakes, and certainly Russians have made their, more than their fair share uh, of mistakes as well. But again, it's such a non-transparent area. But you know, you follow the region pretty closely. What do you think? <laughs> do you want to say anything? Yeah, I <laughs> Can you just wait for a mic? Yeah. Yeah, we, I, I agree that the, the situation is, is, is fairly opaque and that we can't anticipate. Um, I, I wanted to get your take from the Russia perspective since I'm more focused on Central Asia perspectives on it. So um, but thank you. Okay, over there. Kyrgyz Bekanun of Tajikistan. Um, and my question uh, will go, I guess, to all the panel members, and maybe particularly to Ambassador John Ordway. Um, it's not a secret that Central Asia has always been uh, the sphere of uh, Russian interest, and Russia uh, has always been very uh, reluctant and against any foreign presence, and uh, except during the uh, operations, a military operation in, in Afghanistan, when uh, n not only the five Central Asian countries, but uh, Russia had no choice but support the United States in this operation. And as a result, military bases were set up in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan. But today, all these bases are closed, and uh, there's no... Uh, military uh, presence of the United States at all in the region. And the question is why um, uh, the United States did, did not use, uh, make use of such a unique opportunity to transform this presence into something long term and uh, or even permanent if I uh, uh, will. And, uh, uh, or in other words, why did the United States so easily give up on the region which was so strategically important? And as it, it was mentioned, uh, to re-enter the region uh, 
in a uh, foreseeable future is going to be uh, very problematic, to say the least. Thank you. Well, you can say that about a lot of regions in the world when it comes to the United States decisions. But I think particularly in Central Asia, this was a very, you might say, transactional relationship. We went in there after 9-11 because we had specific military support and logistical requirements to support the buildup and then the ongoing combat operations in Afghanistan. So one way or the other, as those operations wound down to an end, the need for those bases would have disappeared. And um, so they would have had no function, and uh, it would have been very difficult to justify the continuing expenditure, and what would they do? I mean, if you look at Manas, Manas was servicing large numbers of flights that came in, used that as an interchange point, and then, and then, and then flew on to Afghanistan. They also provided uh, tanker support for mid-air refueling in Afghanistan. Both those operations were too dangerous to carry on in Afghanistan at the time. We're not doing any of that stuff anymore. So what would our base do there? Uh, yes, it could have stayed for another year or two. We still have some logistical requirements. Uh, we still tried to keep that, uh, that, that logistics and distribution network open, but it really is on its dying gasp. And, and, and so the original purpose having been gone it's very difficult for the United States to come up and come up with a with a with a with a new purpose. That's sort of sort of point one on the U.S. side. Point two on the on the on the Central Asian side. I think uh, you know at that point too the Central. I mean certainly in the case of Kyrgyzstan, you know they got leaned on and they couldn't see a, a reason why they were going to continue on with that, even though it was feeding a lot of very fat golden geese there in Bishkek. That wasn't enough to keep it going. So uh, our, ultimately, our role in Central Asia, I don't think, is going to be on either an, an occupying or a threatening military power. We've got a different role to play. Uh, it's not the role of an immediate neighbor. It's a role of being somewhat more distant and therefore somewhat more um, disinterested, you might say, uh, and therefore perhaps, I would hope, in the long run, to be more trusted. We don't have any designs in the short run or the long run on Central Asian territory. That's not what our troops would be there for. What we want to do, ultimately, bedrock, is we want the same thing the Central Asians want, which is in a very difficult situation, surrounded by neighbors historically who have had very aggressive attention, <coughs> intentions towards the region, to preserve them in their current borders and in the current state. That's our interest, that's their interest, and that's the fundamental interest we have. We're not going to be able to do that with troops or planes. We have to use other means, and that's what we should be concentrating on, including military relationships, but they're not going to involve bases. Do you want to add anything, James? No, thanks. <laughs> Sebastian, anything? No. Okay, next question. Um, thank you. Navbahori Mamba from The Voice of America. Ambassador Ordway, what you said about the history of OC in the region was very interesting, and I've heard from some other European diplomats how initially the, the organization was sort of, you know, uh, reluctant about admitting uh, Central Asian countries. How do you see the current role of the organization? Because on one hand, governments, the states, tend to be very proud of the fact that they are members. But when it comes to actual work, of the organization, um, OC ends up with very limited role, for example, in monitoring the elections and also in during the crisis of 2010 in Kyrgyzstan, the relationship with the OEC almost became a crisis within a crisis. So how do you assess, I mean, how relevant is OEC in the region right now? Well, I think just from the point of view of, of psychology, the fact that they are part of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe with all that goes along with it in terms of, of the, the commitments that were made uh, is very useful. It's very useful for those uh, organizations and groups within the country that want to continue to move in that vector, in that direction. It gives them a real lifeline to hang on to. Uh, it remains a fairly vital and active presence in Central Asia. The, the field, there, are, there are field missions there. They are actively engaged, uh, perhaps in things that are a little less uh, Obvious things like trafficking in persons, uh, uh, in migration, uh, in the economic sphere, uh, some of the softer security areas are also areas in which the OSC has continued to play, uh, play a role. So I think for the, for the most part it's an organization that provides a framework in which you can take advantage of opportunities. And yes, it was true there was some 
there was some uh, very scratchy moments, uh, but in the end, uh, the Kazakhstani chairmanship played, I think, a pretty useful role in that in that situation. So I, I think it can it can cut both ways when it comes down to difficult situations. Um, but I don't see at this point any any change in that relationship. I don't think any of the countries are interested in leaving the OSCE, nor is OSCE as a whole, which is obviously a consensus-built organization with such different membership, it's tough to get consensus sometimes. But I think nonetheless, it's, it, the organization itself is committed to, uh, to doing it. And depending on which uh, chairman in office you get, some have a lot more emphasis on Central Asia. And I think you will see over the years to come, some of the upcoming chairs will also have put a lot more um, emphasis on, on a sort of a headline relationship with Central Asia. Yes, I guess it's Germany next year takes over the chairmanship. Yes, over there. <clears throat> Bakhtiyor Safarov, Tajikistan. I want to follow up in Kyrgyz Bek question to Ambassador Ordal. Uh, after when we had this basis and all policy towards Central Asia, a lot of uh, at least people of Tajikistan thought that there's going to be a lot of you know changes in economical policy and uh, a, a lot of support, which is actually we're seeing. 24,000 people were trained and graduated from universities. So what, after pulling out and the situation what's happening in U Ukraine and Crimea and it's it's going to be Russia is going to tighten the the region and the government start pushing the civil society what do you think is going to happen to those civil society organizations and non-governmental organization that actually exist in the area so what they should do in, in this because you see the superpowers around them and there is not military support f I, I mean how do you see this in the future thank you I think ultimately civil society reflects the strength or the weaknesses of the society in which it is located. And, and so you need to have that very strong fundamental basic support among the population. Uh, you know, brave souls who can speak out in favor of justice definitely deserve support. but. Uh, but it is going to require more than that, and a lot of that has got to come from within the countries themselves. Now, clearly, a lot of these are not fertile ground in terms of the governments or the populations for that kind of, that kind of work. What I think we can do and what we do is to try to keep the lines of communication open. We provide, provide, to provide grants to organizations, our exchange programs, our public statements. Uh, we, we, we continue to, to, to try to do what we can in order to support, but that's it. It's got to be support for something that is there. And some countries you got more to work with and other countries you have less. All we can do is try to do what we can in the moment and hope that as time goes on, it will become more and more apparent that that is the way to a fully functioning society that has stability and, and the prospects for the best prosperity for that country. Uh, you know, we keep going with the message, but we can't guarantee success. On the back there. Farouk al Nazar of GW. Uh, we already mentioned the uh, bear and the tiger, and I would like to bring in another character here to, the, to our animal farm. Uh, it's a giant panda. So these are the relationships uh, between the Central Asian countries and uh, and uh, China, actually, this is the attitude of Central Asian governments towards China, that, um, that China is actually, it's like, it's, like, like it's, it's, it's big, it's friendly, but at the same time it's exotic, and this uh, exotic thing brings a lot of unpredictability. That's why it's hard to handle China and uh, hard to understand what China is actually doing and how to handle this big giant panda. So the question is, goes to Sebastian, obviously. Uh, I believe that Beijing is aware about this kind of uh, attitude or about this kind of thinking towards uh, China and uh, does it actually undertake uh, any kind of efforts uh, to, to change this kind of perception, to change this kind of image, or it, uh, or it is too small to, to, to care about this? Thank you. No, I, this is a question actually I asked you know, when I was working on this topic, uh, when I was traveling to China, trying to explain that there were more and more fear from the Chi Central Asian side towards, uh, to, towards China, that uh, not only the governments, but uh, even more the populations, uh, which were more and more 
uh, I mean, fearing the growing influence of, uh, uh, of China and Central Asia. Uh, well, with the governments, of course, there are more and more meetings and trying to, to negotiate to make them well known. But in, uh, regarding the population, what they're trying to do is really to spread more and more, for example, culture through Confucius centers, through, uh, uh, in, in, to, to, to teach a Chinese language, really to make the Chinese culture more well known in Central Asia, which remains, uh, well, so, I mean, the, the level of knowledge of Central Asia on the Chinese culture remains so, so, so low. But but I mean, see, it changed quite a lot these last few years. See how many Central Asians now, for example, learn Chinese. And see the growing interest of uh, Central Asian young people uh, to learn Chinese and to go to China to, well, to learn the language and to study there. Because for them, it's a way to make a standard of living, to, to, to have a job and so on. And all uh, more and more young people who are involved in learning Chinese, in uh, being more involved in relations with China, we are in the next coming years might in the next coming years grow I mean the, the ladder of, uh, of the political circles and might have more and more responsibilities so I think that China really understood that it has to develop more I mean to to, to develop more education relations I mean to, uh, to invest more in terms of education in terms of knowledge on China in Central Asia but so far obviously uh, the reactions are, I mean, half positive but half negative. I mean, we know that we uh, uh, central. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of debates uh, in Central Asian newspapers, not in Uzbekistan, unfortunately, but in the others. There are a lot of debates on the Chinese uh, growing presence in Central Asia. Let me just add two yeah. things quickly. Sure. One is the um, much of the population of Kazakhstan believes there's a much bigger growing Chinese population than there in fact is. I've for years heard rumors of thousands of Chinese all over the place, and I never saw them. So yes, there's this heightened fear. The other thing is, and you might talked about the sort of the soft power, education, culture, and so forth. We are light years ahead of China in that department. Uh, the number of people who speak English is phenomenal, uh, certainly in Kazakhstan. The other point I would make is that if 10 years ago the, the Kazakhstani elites were sending their kids to university in Russia, today they're sending their high school students to the United States to high school, and they're definitely sending their best and their brightest offspring to Western Europe and to the United States. Um, yes, there are lots of programs. There are more people learning Chinese, but it's still a very small trickle compared to this big volume that is going westward to Europe and the United States. If I'm not mistaken, I mean, Chinese, uh, learn, the learning of Chinese language uh, in Central Asia is, view, is a, now the second foreign language uh, learned. Uh, it depends on whether you consider Russian. Uh, Russian, no. No, 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 no. No, no Russian is not good. Nick Wondra from the Department of Energy. Uh, first for Dr. Rumer and Ambassador Ordway, you mentioned Russia's interest in a maintenance of stability in Central Asia. One tangible um, project is the CSTO Rapid Reaction Force. So to what extent is this a real force? And do you see it having a positive, negative, neutral role in the provision of security in Central Asia. Uh, and then secondly, to Professor Perus, uh, you mentioned the role of the, S, the uh, S, uh, CEO in, in the resolution of uh, border conflicts between Russia, Central Asia, and China. Um, between China and Central Asia. China and Central Asia, excuse me. R regarding Central Asian countries themselves that have border conflicts, do you see the SCO as a potential multilateral mechanism for resolution of border disputes, or is that time past? Um, well, I see the CSTO and that force as a sum of parts. So it depends on the parts and what uh, the owners of those parts are willing to contribute. Um, we don't know the answer to the question of whether in a uh, real emergency in Central Asia they will intervene. The one um, fairly recent uh, example or you know data point that we have uh, from 2010 in Osh suggests that 
The Russians will be very, Russians of course will be the, the backbone, the bulk of that force. Uh, and they've shown very little appetite uh, in intervening uh, in, in a real domestic emergency. And again, uh, these are kind of not direct indicators, but if you look at the conflict in Ukraine and Russian public opinion data, while there is very strong support for the policy of the Russian government in Ukraine, there is pretty strong opposition in the Russian public to a direct military involvement in large numbers in Ukraine, and that only volunteers should uh, uh, should be engaged. So uh, that leads me to believe that Russia will be very careful and cautious before committing to uh, to, that, to, to an operation under that mandate. John? Yeah, I, I really wouldn't disagree with anything. I think CSTO is just Russian forces under a different flag. It needs the permission of the other members to raise that flag. But ultimately, it's Russia's decision as to how they're going to respond. And in some cases, they've, they've sent, like border guards have for a long time were very active in, in Tajikistan, and then they left. Uh, they could come back. If, if asked, and they could either have a CSTO flag or they could have a Russian flag. It's really, I think, going to depend on the situation and their call at the time. And for, uh, to answer your question, uh, no, the SCO, uh, I've never seen that, never um, succeeded in playing any kind of role. I mean, trying to solve the border issues between Central Asian countries or even other, you know, uh, conflicts, for example, on water issues. Sometimes some countries even asked uh, the SEO or, the, uh, or China to be more involved, and China systematically refused to, to do that. So, so far, I've never seen uh, the SEO really playing a role in uh, negotiating uh, the, the borders between Central Asian countries. Okay, um, maybe we'll take two or three more questions and then give our panelists a last uh, round. Did I see any hands up there? All right, <laughs> just one question from <laughs> David Abrams. That's fine. <clears throat> um, another question for Eugene. Um, and this isn't based on something that you brought up in your presentation. Um, with the, the reports that among the fighters, militants who are from Central Asia who are uh, ending up in Syria and Iraq, whether with uh, Islamic State or in other fighting for other reasons there, um, we have some evidence, um, but a lot of it is anecdotal, that, that, that many have sort of join net, these networks via, from being in Russia as labor migrants. Um, and I get the impression that Russia, the Russian government has a very um, minimal uh, interest or is not taking, being very active in monitoring uh, Central Asian communities in Russia as migrants, maybe because migrants are often invisible as communities in many ways, except when they're the targets of xenophobia or nationalism? Um, or are they outsourcing this to uh, Central Asian security services to, to do the monitoring? I'm just wondering if Russia is overlooking something, uh, if, if you have a sense of that, um, and something that might come back to bite them before it comes back to bite Central Asia, if it bites anybody. Um, well, I didn't refer to it because others have um, in previous presentations. Um, but I think it's a very real concern. I think the um, reportedly poor conditions in which Central Asian workers live in Russia contribute to what I think is our understanding of this fertile ground uh, for recruitment by some of these extremist organizations and volunteers going to uh, the conflict region. I wouldn't say, again, well, this is with a caveat that uh, we don't know much about Russian efforts in this area. Um, I would r return the question to you and ask, you know, what, what you know, what you can tell us about this situation. But um, 
there was recently a Security Council meeting devoted to the problem of combating violent extremism. The fact that Director Bortnikov attended the meeting here in Washington, I think, is indicative of the fact that the Russians are concerned about this. Um, in keeping with their tradition and in keeping with the currently very, very bad state of relations between Russia and the United States, they're not going to share a whole lot, I think. Um, but I wouldn't be, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that they're actually doing uh, more uh, to address this problem, perhaps not in the way that we would address this problem, although I don't know of anybody who has found a good way of addressing this problem. So I, I wouldn't say that they're turning a blind eye to it. I think there have been explicit statements on this set of issues by both uh, Security Council Secretary Patrushev and President Putin recently. I just add that there are precious few labor migrants from Kazakhstan in Russia, and they still have the same issue that the other Central Asians do in terms of ISIL recruitment and people going. Again, it's not huge. We're talking hundreds and a population of 17 million, but anyone would be worse. And they, like everybody else, don't have a handle on it either. Well, I think, um, oh, is there one more? All right, this is the last one. <laughs> right. uh, Stanley Kober. Um, I'm wondering how we would have access to this region given certain developments. I mean, a lot of these countries, you know, are landlocked. I mean, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan border the Caspian. But the United States projects its power largely by sea. You know, we're not going to go through Iran. I was just reading an article about uh, al-Qaeda now being... Uh, uh, more present in Karachi. A lot of our you know, transit to that area goes through Karachi. And the roads in Pakistan are also now under attack. If Russia decides it's not going to cooperate, it's fed up with us, how much of a presence can we sustain just in terms of support, given the location and the logistics? No need, no yeah. plans, or no intention for a permanent military. Oh, uh, knows. Uh, uh, for <laughs> permanent military presence in Central Asia. And we have no presence in Central Asia, Asia so, so it's, it's nearly, uh, I don't quite it's understand. A highly, the it's a highly theoretical. It's a highly theoretical problem at this point. If you want a theoretical answer, there are answers that involve Turkey, Azerbaijan, the Caspian, Cross. some other things. But it's a highly theoretical answer to a theoretical problem that doesn't exist. Well, I think as we um, end this conference and we try and answer the question, Central Asia, what's next? We've had uh, many ideas. It's been a very rich discussion, and we will certainly leave with a higher sense of confusion, but um, hoping that we will bring everybody back <laughs> uh, maybe next year and see what's next then. Please uh, join me in thanking the panel.